Hello, and welcome back to the Security Spotlight Podcast. My name is Max Robidoux from the Portfolio Marketing Team here at Dell Technologies. And this week, we're diving into another hot topic in the security landscape, ransomware. And specifically today, we're going to be talking about ESG's 2023 Ransomware Preparedness Survey. So with me today, as always, is my co-host, Steve Keniston. And we'd also like to introduce a very special guest to the podcast, Brian White. Brian, welcome to the podcast. Hey, man, appreciate you guys bringing me onto this podcast. I'm ready to have some fun on here. And uh, I miss you guys, you know, <laughs> where you guys been, I mean. Yeah, yeah we, we miss you in too, Brian. Box here. <laughs> hey, Brian, before we get started, would you mind giving a quick introduction to yourself for our audience who might not be aware of um, who you are? Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, Brian White, I'm in the product marketing group for data protection here at Dell Technologies. I've been in IT, ooh, almost 30 years. <laughs> Ooh, that's a long time. Going your uh, age, Brian. I know, you know, <laughs> and it's all been focused on data protection and information management, helping, you know, customers from SMB all the way to large enterprise. You know, so glad to awesome. be here. Hey, well, we're happy to have you on today. So as I mentioned at the top, we're talking about the 2023 ransomware preparedness survey that ESG just released. So as part of the survey, ESG surveyed about 600 IT and cybersecurity professionals, uh, both in U.S. and Canada. And these were the professionals who were involved with either the processes or the technology uh, associated with protecting against ransomware. So what they did in this research is they're kind of evaluating the progress that these organizations had in the past 18 months, whether it's you know identifying best practices or preparing for threats so we want to jump into um, a couple of the major findings from this survey. So right out and right from the jump, one of the biggest things that they mentioned in the survey itself is the inevitability of ransomware. And you know what, Steve, we've talked about it a couple times in this podcast now. It's, you know, it's no longer a question of if, but it's when for a lot of these organizations. Um, could you touch on a little bit about this kind of perception about how prevalent ransomware is and this kind of um, thought process that it's, you know, inevitable now. So was that I, I wasn't sure that was me or Steve, um, you know, <laughs> well, see, this one makes this podcast good with us. Right. So, <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's when you're going to get hit, right. You know, we, everybody uses the other term, the combination, but I'm like, when you get hit, what are you going to do? That's the way I look at it because you're going to get hit. If you haven't been hit, you know someone that has been hit. I get messages every morning on my phone of somebody getting hit, whether it's healthcare, manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, education, you name it, they're going to get hit. So, I mean, if you're not prepared for this, um, you're missing something. And if you work in IT, as long as I have, it's just automatic. Right. When you when you think of it, it's automatic. When you think of data protection, there's one word that comes into mind that is the most important word, and that's recovery. And if you're not prepared for, you know, these ransomware attacks uh, to be able to recover, uh, you got you got to think you got to think again, rethink your strategy. You know? I also think, Brian, and I'd be interested in your opinion, right, this whole the if when thing, I think, you know, it. We use it because it, it's real and it's important. It's a little right. overused, you know, considering, I mean, but we see this every single day, right? Oh, yeah. But I think like this whole notion around resilience and building resilience is really a function of the whole if when, right? So right. people have shifted their mindset to say, okay, I now I know I'm going to get hit. Now, now I need to be thinking about just exactly what you said. What do I do when? it happens, right? Am I prepared? And that's a nice thing that the survey called out, right, about uh, folks now kind of leaning more into the when and, and am I prepared and what should I be thinking about, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, that's exactly it, right? You know, it's resilience. And I always talk about resilience like boxing, right? So can, I, can your company take a punch and keep on going, right? Take the punch and keep moving, keep bobbing and weaving and keep progressing, right? You get a punch and you get knocked out, you're going to be the paying a ransom. You're going to be talking to SEC, right? Your, <laughs> your employees are going to be mad. Your customers are going to be mad because you're laying on that canvas. 
don't fall down. Bob and weave, keep moving, have a real good strategy of who's ever in your corner to help you with this boxing technique, right? Uh, to be able to get through that ransomware resilience or cyber resilience or data resilience, however you want to call it, that resilience is really the, the key. Yeah. yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, Brian. And, you know, to uh, quote the the great band Chumbawamba, you know, you get knocked down, you get back up again. So um, kind of going <laughs> off of that a little bit, you mentioned data recovery. So one of the good stats that we pulled from that survey was, you know, 89% of these IT and cybersecurity professionals, they rank ransomware as a top five threat to their organization. So looking at it from the data recovery lens, what are some of the challenges specifically that organizations face after a successful ransomware attack that they need to kind of bounce back from like we were just talking about? Yeah, and 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 that's the that's one of the hard questions, right? Um, because it's different from each company per se. Um, when you look at them trying to recover, they have to understand what data is the most important data that I need to be able to recover to keep my business running, right? And it depends on what you're in, right? If you're in manufacturing, you got to make sure your manufacturing uh, processes and workflows are still going so you can produce. If you're in sales, you got you got you know a little bit different that you have. If you're in pharmaceuticals, different. You know, if you're in some type of high tech priority that protects a lot of information and data that actually is what your, you know, your business is all about, you got to protect that data. But a lot of times people forget about the infrastructure, right, that comes into play. And that infrastructure can be spread across so many different locations. And it's how do you protect that, right? If my data is, you know, in five different places and my infrastructure is based off of six or seven different data centers, how do I actually protect that? How do I you know, what strategy do I put in place that if something happens, can I actually recover from that or, you know, rebuild from it? Because disaster recovery is different than ransomware attacks and cyber recovery, right? They're, they're, they're majorly different, right? They all both deal with recovery, but the concept comes in is what are you actually recovering, right? For your business to continue going and generating revenue, right? Those are the things you have to start out for as your priority on, you know, what do I need to protect? What's the major thing that I need to protect? Where do I need to protect it? Right. And who needs access to it? Because people are also the challenge. Do I have Max in the right place? Is Steve in the right place? If something happens, can I communicate with them? Do they, you know, are we connecting with the right resources in order to recover from this attack or this disaster? You know, we got to make sure those workflows and those processes are in place. So it's a lot of challenges, it just depends. And that's why you have to think about the strategy that you want to put in place on making sure your resources, your data, your people, your processes are all been kind of laid out. The greatest IT answer. It depends, right? <laughs> it depends, yeah. You know? I do think, Brian, though, there there are, I think there are two things that bookend this notion about the challenges around recovery that oftentimes when I'm talking to customers, they kind of see a little bit of the light and as an aha moment, right? All the things that you said are critically important. <clears throat> but the very first thing that you said is, what? What do I have to protect? And so I find that that organizations that spend time doing a little bit of data classification or infrastructure classification, let's say, right? Classifying what applications are most important, what data that comes from these applications is most important, you know, what needs to be up first, right? There's a whole notion around ensuring that, yeah, I'm going to have to pick a strategy to protect that and protect it the right way. But if I don't, if I don't protect, if I don't protect it the right way and ensure not just backing it up, but the recovery sets of capabilities, like how quickly can I get the most important set of data back, right? That's that's where the breakdown happens, right? If I I can back up a petabyte in, a, of data in an evening, right? We've proven that the, the technology is now there to be able to do that. But I can't recover a petabyte of data in, in 24 hours, right? Right. And, and I might not need a petabyte of data to ensure my business is operational, right? So have I really done the right classification and segmentation. And then the back end of that bookend is the practice, right? So many people, great ideas, <laughs> stuff's on paper, you know, looks great. Have you tested it? No. <laughs> well, how do you know 
you can actually do what you want to do, right? There's there's the notion of I got to be able to I, I got to I got to have that in, have that confidence, right? And I, I, I've said this a number of times. I think Max likes the analogy, right? It's like the military, right? I practice, 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 so that when something does happen, it's second nature. I know what to recover. I know what's going to happen. I feel confident about that. And to your point with ransomware, anything can happen, right? So if I got to use a bunch of intellectual brain gas to go figure out this weird twist. I don't have to worry about the stuff that I that I know is going to come up okay. So, I mean, I, I do find those are those are two ends that people should spend a, a, as much time on as they do, you know, the technology that they're putting in place. No, and and you hit it again. Practice, practice, practice. If you're not testing your workflow, your processes, um, then then again, you're missing the point. Again, as a boxer, I'm not me a boxer, but boxers, <laughs> they have to spa. Right. They're, they they go do training. Right. And then they're training. They get knocked down, but it's not the actual real match. Right. So it's OK that you go through your testing and your testing fails. But that's what you fix. Right. All these things. Help you learn. plug the holes. That's how you learn it. You know, that's right. a strategy. Yeah. So just mentioning a little bit and going a little bit deeper on that processes aspect, I think one of the most interesting pieces of this ransomware survey was there was. Um, a section talking about preventative controls and kind of looking at the preparedness gaps. And there's like a really interesting alignment between um, areas they call the, the preventative controls, whether it's, you know, network security, endpoint security, um, backup and DR infrastructure and email security. And these also, while being these critical preventative controls, also were some of the biggest gaps in the ransomware preparedness that the organizations noted. So could we talk a little bit about, you know, what some of these organizations can do to help um, increase their preparedness or even some of these like backup and recovery best practices, you know, in addition to obviously, you know, looking at some of these preventative controls. Um, <clears throat> slow down. Um, <laughs> I, I hate to say it, right. It's, it, it's slow down because you, you have so many different innovations and new applications and new things coming into play. And so many people want to jump on board and just say, hey, I, I want to implement this. I want to implement this. I want to implement this. And what they forget about is the back part about that. If I implement it, can I recover from something that doesn't work right? And they miss on that. And when you think about network security, as you spend, expand your business, some people have, they add more networks, they add more information, uh, you know, they add more people to manage the different, you know, these different networks and these endpoints. And a lot of the times they don't actually have the skill set to do it, to truly understand what those network capabilities are, right? So different products, you know, I won't name any products, but, you know, when, when you put a network out there, you got to make sure that, okay, is my firewall in place correctly? And do I want Steve to access this network and I don't want Max to access this other network, right? And what they do is they go so fast, they don't slow down to understand and really put in a true strategy, which means recovery or resilience, as we're talking about, right? Your strategy has to be resilience on whatever you decide to add. Even your endpoints, your laptops, your desktops and laptops that you have, you know, what security controls do you want uh, your end users to have? And sometimes it's wide open, which is wrong. And sometimes it's really, you know, confined. Um, and that could be good or bad, just depends on, again, depends on your business, right? And then your backup infrastructure. Do you want all your backup in a central location? Do you want your backup local to different regions? And that also comes with compliance and regulations that come into play. But all these things are keys to, you know, this strategy and these preventive controls that you have to put in place and you have to prepare to plug up your gaps, right? And skill sets is really big in this process um, and process, again, which slow down, understand your skill set, understand the tools that you're using to really put in the right process and strategy. I, I like what you said, Brian, about slow down, right? Because uh, I think about this in terms of, um, and this might seem a little high level, but but give me some runway here, right? Like um, a, lo a lot of companies think of a framework, right? So maybe the executives come up with this framework and they push it down to the to the you know IT infrastructure team and say, okay, let's go let's go solve the problem, right, with these tools, and 
But I don't think a lot of people stop and slow down, like you said, and take a look at that framework and say, well, how does it apply to me, right? So if you think about, let's just pick a very simple framework, right? Let's think about if a company says, well, I need solutions to um, uh, reduce the attack surface that of people coming into my organization, right? And I need capabilities that help me to detect and respond things that are going on should we just went through the nuts, not if, but when, when they get in, right? Mm -hmm. And then I need the recovery. Now, a lot of folks would say, oh, I'm in the recovery bucket. Run, go, let's go solve that problem, right? Mm -hmm. But if you slow down and you think about, as I think about the tools that I want to put into place mm -hmm. to be able to solve the bigger problem of resilience, how should I be thinking about it in terms of the entire framework, right? So, you know, we've talked about the fact that uh, solutions that offer things like multi factor authentication and roles-based access, right? Those are solutions that really help to reduce the attack surface. Right. And a lot of the backup solutions that we know do those things, right? So you're, you're actually preventing, you're doing a lot of attack surface reduction. Yeah, sure, it's probably for the backup, but ultimately that's where ransom people can get in, right? Oh. Then you want to take advantage of solutions that do the, the detection and response, if you can, right? Mm -hmm. Capabilities like CyberSense help you to detect things going on in the backup? Well, there's a great answer for, for that bucket. Right. And then clearly there's the recovery bucket and in the data protection world, there, there's recovery, right? So it's not just, you know, rushing to go solve your problem, it's slowing down, thinking about what are my overall objectives and what solutions, or what do I think about about the solutions I'm putting in mm -hmm. to make sure I'm maximizing what I need to get out of that framework. And that, I, th I think that's critically important. Right, right. And, and, and when you think of all those things, right, people have to communicate. People have to talk about these things as opposed to just pointing and say, you do it, you do it, you do it. It's like, no, we have to do this, right? If something happens to the organization, we are affected. So that slow down, take your time, understand the preventive tools that can come into place, understand the recovery tools that can come into place. Everybody in IT needs to understand that situation. Right. And that's why there's there's sometimes there's a skills gap because, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, person A has to know everything that person Z knows, but they have to know something and they have to be willing to learn and work together to make these things improve to help your business become more resilient altogether. Right. And that comes starts from the executive level all the way down to, you know, just, you know, just a, a, a low level admin, you know, in that place. Yep. Yeah. And. Kind of going off of that a little bit, and see, this is something we've been talking about recently. I feel like there's this kind of notion that you know speed and innovation kind of go hand in hand. So we want to you know kind of emphasize the point that you know <laughs> security is not trying to stand in the way of innovation. We say slow down. What we're trying to do is we're trying to kind of build this foundation. We want to make sure you have the right processes. We want to make sure you're prepared. So that way, when you try to do all these things, or like Brian, you mentioned, you want to try to adopt all these new apps, you know, adopt all these new processes, you have that kind of strong foundation to build off of mm -hmm. for an organization there. So just, you know, wanted to touch on that point. When we say slow down, we're not trying to you know, slow down everything down. I know today everything's going like a million miles an hour. Everyone wants to innovate and adopt all these new you know, products, best practices. But what we're trying to do is just, we still want you to do that. We just want you to do it you know, safely and smartly, essentially, right. what we're doing. So we're almost at the end of time here. Um, I'll start with you, Brian. Do you have anything you mm -hmm. want to leave our audience with? Um, just as kind of a final piece of advice, whether it's, you know, generally about ransomware preparedness or about one of the stats in the survey itself? Um, I mean, you, there's so many different types of data protection concepts, right? You know, you, you have snapshots, you have cloud services, um, air gap, or what we like to say, isolation more, immutable copies, all these things come into play to help with your data protection story, right? Or your cyber resilience or your data resilience strategy, right? From your endpoints, make sure you understand the security that needs to be on the endpoints, who's supposed to access those endpoints, right? Role-based access on an endpoint per se, right, is one way of meaning that I can access Max's laptop or Steve's laptop because they're in two different organizations in the business, right? Multi-factor authentication is very important on making sure 
you know, the right person is accessing the right data. We we have that right now with so many different applications and and banking systems and just anything, right? Even, even I think my 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 power uh, company has a multi-factor authentication make sure I'm the right person saying, hey, I, I need to pay this bill or, or something of that nature. Um, but you got to go through the testing, right? Whether you're using any of those type of formats of data protection, go through the testing. Test to make sure that you can recover. Disaster recovery testing is one thing. Cyber resilience and ransomware recovery is another. Go through the testing because that's really what's important. Just like Steve mentioned, he's like, once you practice, 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 it's second nature, right? You, I think you really would want to prepare or take the scenario. Can I recover from a ransomware attack in four hours or four days? Or can I recover in one day or <laughs> 15 days? So when you practice, those are the things that you want to do, right? It's not necessarily saying, oh, I'm going to recover in 10 minutes. It's your strategy has to come into place. You have to recover efficiently, right? Because you also want that point in time of your data to be good. You don't want to restore corrupt data. And that's what happens a lot. Oh, I, I'm going to restore from the backup and we recover and we start things back up and going and we still have disruption because we restored corrupt data. You've got to restore good data to a good point in time in order for your business to continue running. And I think some of the some of the data in the surveys showed that some people were doing that. And I think that's great that um, more people are learning to be able to recover from events. So I think, you know, we've been talking about this for years, right? Ransomware prepares, things of that nature. And uh, I think people are starting to get it. But there is a large gap of people that still aren't. And that's what we're really, you know, we want to help with and, and talk about. Great, Steve. Anything to leave the uh, audience with as well? I I just think I think that what, how Brian ended there is really good. Like uh, at first, I think we want to thank you. Uh, we we do this ransomware survey every year, and it was it's really helpful to learn from. And and I think Brian, your suggestion about when when you take a first of all, I think everyone should take a look at the survey and don't think of it as a way to. Uh, a bunch of statistics that are out there to scare you, right? I think if you look at it with the lens of how are things progressing, how have they progressed from, you know, 2020, 2021, 2023, like, where are we? There are a bunch of factoids in this analysis that show that some folks are really understanding and, and closing a lot of the, the the gap areas that were problems in the past. And the nice thing about that is as solutions become more and more clear and it becomes easier to figure out how to implement those. You can shine those headlights on things that are issues that you want to, that, that could then potentially be an issue, right? In, in your area, right? And then, and then as you see those things, right, it's also good to, to partner with someone uh, and, and do an assessment of your, of your environment to find out even more about what others might know, right? Other people with expertise might be able to call out. Now, you can't solve all the problems all the time. There, you got to balance the budget along with along with the, the challenges. But if you can if you can see some places where you're making improvements and and refocus some of that budget into areas after getting an assessment of where you should probably be thinking, I think you're really uh, gaining on yourself, right? You want to you want to advance your maturity. You're not going to jump to the end. You just want to advance it as best you can, right? And I think that's one of the nice things that the survey calls out. Yeah, couldn't agree more. I mean, and if anyone listening wants to read the entire survey, the link to the whole survey will be in the description of the episode. And as always, please listen and like, subscribe, watch us on YouTube. We're on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well for the Security Spotlight Podcast. And to learn more about our Dell Technologies security portfolio, please visit us at dell.com slash security solutions. Brian and Steve, thank you very much for joining me on the podcast today. Thank Thanks, you. Max.